when you were born and where you live. I was born in 1923 at St. Joseph's Hospital, and uh, I lived in South St. Paul, and I had a fine education, and then when I finished high school, I had to carry out what Mrs. Tui told me. I had to go to the university to study to be a dietitian. So tell us about Mrs. Tui. What's the story with the cookie? <laughs> well, Mrs. Tui lived next door to, uh, to my grandmother, and that she's the one. If a different neighbor had my grandmother wanted her to have a cookie, I might have brought it to her. And who knows, I might have become an engineer or something. But Mrs. Tui said I should become a, a dietitian. Okay. Now, tell us when you first met. Well, oh, I forgot to ask you what your name is. What? What's your name? Oh, my name is Lorraine. And my maiden name was Blumenfeld, B-L-U-M-E-N-F-E-L-D. And then after I marry this wonderful man we're going to talk about, I became Hertz. So now I am known as Lorraine Hertz. Okay. So tell us when you first met Mark Hertz. When I went to the university, the first day I was there, I sat down because President Franklin Roosevelt was going to speak and was going to declare war on Japan because of the bombing of Pearl, Pearl Harbor. And sitting in back of me was a friend I had from camp, and she introduced from a friend of hers from high school, and lo and behold, his name was Marky, M-A-R-K-Y, Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z. And... What do you else do? You, what, now, this was on December 8th, 1941, right? It was December 8th, 1941. December 7th. Well, was the 7th the day of Pearl Harbor? Yeah. So this was the next day. Yes, you are correct. It was the 8th that, that, I, that war was declared. Now, which do you remember? What, what was more important to you on that day? The declaration of war or meeting Marky Hertz? Um, the most important thing to me was the declaration of war. I had known about Pearl Harbor, and uh, he could have been anybody. But the thing was, President Roosevelt declared war, and that's what was important to me. Now, after that happened, you continued taking classes at the university. Right? Yes, I did. And did you spend any time with Marky while you were taking classes in the next year? Well, the first class I took was a class in chemistry. And lo and behold, the same person who had sat behind me at, at the, uh, when I heard about the Declaration of War was the same fellow. Marky Hertz was there. And I'm sorry to admit that he and I were really not very good students. But I helped him, and he helped me, and I know that I got a D, and I had never seen a D in my whole life. I got a D in chemistry, and I don't know what mark he got. I didn't follow up on what his grade was. But then, um, what was your first... What did you do to get to know each other? Um, what happened, we mostly spent our time talking about the professor, that we didn't like the professor. He wasn't helping us and we weren't doing well, but we liked his, he had an aide that helped us. So Marky and I would stay after class with this young aide that was, you know, a young student at the U. And so we studied with him, and that's how it happened. And then when I moved to live with my grandmother in St. Paul, then Marky said, I don't live far from there. Let me drive you to work and, and drive me to school. And so that's what happened. So he drove me 
to the university for about the first two years I went. Oh, no, only about six months, I think. Well, maybe six, six months. months. But now, what happened when you were riding in the car with him? Well, the thing that happened, I always asked this woman, young woman who was in some of my classes, why she would get out of the car when Marky would drive up to my grandmother's house, and I'd come running out to get in the car, and I was happy to get in the back seat, but no, she got out and she says, no, Marky says, you're to get in first, and then I'll get in. So I sat next to him for about a year, going to and from the university all the time. And did you have any idea of why he wanted you in the front seat? Well, I finally asked her, I said, why are we doing that? She said, I don't know. He just told me that's what I'm supposed to do. So I figured a ride is a ride. So I didn't care. You didn't realize it was a romantic no, strategy? No, I, I, I did not think of him in a romantic way because I knew some fraternity boys and I knew Marky Hertz was a poor boy, and he was not a university boy. So I never thought of him in that way. He didn't meet your standards? No, it's just I, I don't know. I, and it's not that it was my standard. It's just not my expectations, I guess. Okay. Then what do you remember about his decision to join the Air Force? Did he tell you about it? What, what do you remember? Because it was yeah. in the spring you know, summer. You know, I sat, I sat next to him when the president declared war. And then, then we talked a little bit about the war, and he said that he wants, he wants to learn to go into the Air Corps, and he's going to look into that. So that took him, oh, three or four weeks until he got, took his course to get in, and then he was accepted into the Air Corps, and he was very happy and very proud and moved right along with dropping out of the university and going into, um, I think he went to Texas. Right. A, and what did you think about that? Did you have strong I, opinions? I was very proud of him. Actually, we all, everybody was very proud of President Roosevelt and anybody that I felt that would help our country become a better country, such as Mark would do, then to me, Mark was a hero. So he was a hero just by enrolling and in getting into the Air Corps. Okay, so now he started writing letters to you. Yes, I think you will see some of those letters may be in this book. Well, here's one written in July of 19... Um, uh, oh, that's... I'm sorry, that's 1943. Sorry, we have to get to 1942. So in July of 42, were the letters very romantic, the first letters, or were they just kind of newsy letters? They were just telling me every, every class he was taking, they were not romantic. Okay. Now, in early 1943, you were still taking classes at the university, right? And you moved to Minneapolis for a while. You lived on 11th Avenue Southeast. And then he wrote you a letter where, here's what I found, one of the first romantic letters it was a whole year after he enrolled. It says, I just got your letter, and unfortunately we don't have your letter from that time. And it says, I'm not surprised that I grew on you. I have been pestering you for a long time. I have tried to tell you a hundred times without offending you that I liked you. I'm so darn fond of you, Bloom. I hope you believe I'm serious when I say so. If I could only come home and grab an armful of you, I could convince you pretty quick. 
So what was going on? Well, there, uh, that was something new to me, but that was very interesting to me. So within a short time, he came home and he borrowed his, his cousin's car, Lloyd E. Hertz's car, and he had a date and he took me out, I think, two or three nights in one weekend. Well, hold off on that story for just a bit. We're not there yet. So before he came for that visit, did your feelings towards him get stronger in those next couple of months before he came for a visit? Or was it still kind of just, he's one of the guys? Well, he, he wasn't an, a fraternity boy, so he wasn't an important boy in that part of my life. And he wasn't, no, I don't think he was that important. But what was important is that he was studying to become a pilot. It's the pilot that did it. That was a very romantic activity for a young soldier to have. Now, um, in September of 1943, I want to read something that you wrote. It's very. I want to read something you wrote. All right. I, this I, is a letter of appreciation. Do you know how happy I am? I just float around. Life is so wonderful, and I'm the luckiest person of all. Take everything I have and subtract anything, and I would still be happy. But subtract you, and everything I have would be nothing. Well, that was, evidently, I am beginning to have very warm thoughts about him. But this is even before he came for that visit. Did I, was that before the yeah, visit? this was in September of 1943. I don't know, it must have been the airplane that did it. I really don't remember. Because here's what I'm fascinated by. You haven't seen each other in over a year. Probably. All your communication is by letters. But your feelings are really changing, just from his letters. Well, in, in going over this book, I realized how really beautifully he wrote, how his thoughts, he expressed his thoughts. And evidently, I had begun to see that at this early stage. So you saw, it was like a window into him through his letters. You saw him in a different way through his letters. Absolutely. It was, I had just thought of him as my, my girlfriend's acquaintance from high school. But then I began to see much more depth in, in him. And then, then tell me about the visit. He made a visit to St. Paul. He came back to St. Yes, Paul. He came back, and, and we went out a few times. And by then, I had fallen in love. Tell us about what... We went to a movie, and I don't remember the movie. I don't remember anything, but he wore his uniform. <laughs> what was so special about guys in uniform? Air Corps uniform is something very special. Was it sexy? It was beautiful. It was wonderful. There are pictures in there. Oh, we're going to look at a lot of pictures. No, he was a very good-looking guy. I know. Now, his... Um... I'll tell you how good-looking he is. I now am 97, and a new woman moved into my nursing home, and she says, is she married to Marky Hertz? And they said, yes, he has died. But she says, he was the cutest boy in our whole high school. So take a look at that picture. Yeah, that's how he looked. That's how when I went out with him. But now, at 97, they're still talking about how cute he was. And here's another one. Well, same. It's the same war. And now, by then, um, so you say he had a car and he came and picked you up and took you to the movies. What else do you remember about that? 
nothing else, but I was smitten. <laughs> now, what was your understanding then of what was going on in the war and in Germany? Well, I was certainly involved with it. I belonged to a group at the university. I don't remember what it was called, but we followed the war. No, I was very much involved with it. My father had been in the First World War. No, I was, I was, an, and oh, and I was a nurse's aide and worked. What did, that, what did that mean, being a nurse's aide? Well, I worked at the hospital and I did not charge the hospital anything. I did that because the real nurse had gone off to service. And what did you understand? Had you know, did you know much at all about what was happening to the Jewish community in, in Germany and in Europe? I was beginning to know when I was at the university. I, I learned more about it. There was a Hillel group, and we would have groups, and we would talk about what was going on. No, I was keeping up with what was going on. And was that important in terms of Marquis uh, joining the Air Force? The fact that you were Jewish? Um, I would, I think so. It seemed to me that he felt he wanted to fight against people like the Germans who were killing Jews. So after he came to visit, when did he first start talking about getting married to you? Oh, that must have been about two years later. I don't no, know. No, it couldn't have been because he came to visit you at the end of 43, and you got married just a few months later. Or did he come to visit earlier? I, I would have to look at that okay. again. But what do you remember about the suggestion about getting married? What, when, when did you start talking about getting married? He, the boys who were in service stayed together. They, if they would be in one group, and then that group would pass on to another one. And it was, as you read this book, you will see there were always girlfriends and, and wives involved in all of his letters. And when did he, what? What do you remember about his suggesting getting married to you? Was that his idea or your idea? I have a funny feeling it might have been my idea. He was happy with it, but I, but I don't I don't remember his saying to my mother and father, "May I have your daughter's hand in marriage?" There's nothing like that. It was just sort of assumed that that's Lorraine's boyfriend and she's probably going to marry him. It was something like were that. There any, were there any other candidates? Not that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> no. Nobody he was competing with. No, not that I remember. Okay, so in December of 1943, he writes, this is very sentimental, you know, I don't remember Dad being very poetic, but he always loved you, and that is really clear. Listen to this. You know I love you. The way I feel about you, I want to thunder your name out when I think of you. You know you're impulsive, and I don't mean that as a reflection on you, but a truth. You know we are for each other, just as sure as God is in the heavens. I know you think I'm too damn practical and that I'll spend my whole life being practical. You're pretty wrong if you do. I know this. I don't want to spend any more of my life that's humanly possible away from you, nor do I want to have you look for me in the mailbox every day. I feel I'm being torn apart by inner desires. I hear one voice saying, don't marry now, it isn't fair to her. That lasts a few seconds. 
And then for the next 23 hours and 59 minutes, another voice says, Mary, love's enough. I think I'm going to cry, so excuse any lack of coordination from here on. So that got you hooked? That was nice. Yes. So then it says, don't you dare think I don't know how badly you want to get married. There isn't anything wrong with me, and no two people have ever felt the way we do, and we have every right to be happy in loving each other. No. How does that make you feel? That makes me feel sad. Why does it make you feel sad? Well, it makes me remember, is what it does. It makes me remember. And it's all true. Those things all happen. Part of it, I think, it, it was a kind of a feeling of war and that many people felt that way. I found when I met his friends, they all had wives and girlfriends. It was sort of quite, I don't want to say common, because that makes it seem ordinary, but it was many, many people were getting married and were happy and excited about getting married. And they were in service, but they still made plans for their wives. Did, did you feel like it helped him emotionally to know that you were there? Yes, I felt definitely. That was that a patriotic duty, a patriotic gift to marry him? Well, to some extent, yes. And it's not, not a complete that I was doing it just to be patriotic, but it made him look much more important than he did before he went into service. Because that's one of the things that comes through with the letters, is that here it is, this big war is going on, he's learning to be a soldier, but his mind and his heart is with you. And that is like, that keeps him steady. It keeps him focused. He has a purpose. Yes. Is that, is that sort of what was going on? That he had a, every day there was a purpose of telling you his story and writing to you and hearing from you that if you didn't, if you weren't there, he might have been much more lonely. Yes. I know that I felt I was a much more patriotic person because of his feeling toward me. So then... You start planning your wedding. Tell us about how you, what the planning went into your wedding. Well, I, I think that I'm going to jump right into the trip down to, down to Florida. By then, my, uh, Mark had moved over to Florida, and he was in, Ava, I think, Avon Park near Palm, Palm Beach. Yes. And the thing is, we were so busy at taking care of the wedding that it reminds me, and I'm sure that that's in the letter there, that my mother said that she had kind of a hard time going down there. She, she and I did not sit together. She sat behind me somewhere, and she always tells the story that she was sitting next to a woman and said, oh, where are you going? She says, oh, I'm going. My daughter's getting married in uh, Florida. I'm going down there. She says, but I don't see your daughter. She says, oh, she's sitting up there. She, did, she didn't want to sit with me. And why didn't you want to sit with your mother? Well, that made me seem so childish. I was a big girl. I was getting married. I didn't want to be traveling with my mother. So why did she come with you? She came. She felt she had a duty to make sure that I had a proper wedding. 
And uh, she was wonderful, but I wasn't nice, but she forgave me. So before, so here's a letter written a month, uh, three weeks before you got married, mm -hmm. where you said, I sent you a telegram suggesting we call off our wedding plans. You sent Marky a letter saying, I'm writing this on Friday just after I sent you the telegram suggesting we call off the wedding plans. And then she says, then she, you say, I admit was wrong in wanting so desperately to get married now. Here is where our faith in each other must take hold. So it says here, it says here, I, I think we should postpone our wedding. Do you remember that? I don't remember that. You sort of blocked that out of your mind. That's true. Okay. Well, then you're all set and you decide to get married because he writes, get here any way you can, ride, walk, or swim but come to me as soon as you can and as fast as you can. I love you. I want you. I'm lonesome without you. So what did you think about, does that make you feel ready to get on the train? I moved as fast as I could. Okay. And then you got there and tell us what happened when you got to Florida. Well, we had a lot, of, lot to do. We, he had about one day off, and we had to find a place to buy a ring. We had to find a rabbi. We had to find a place to get married, where we should get married. We had to do a lot of things in about one day, and it's amazing how we did. And I think the um, a symbol of how we moved fast is that we needed to have a best man. I know everybody has a best man. Well, all the men, the boys that were in service, they were in service. He got the day off because he was getting married, but we didn't have any best man. So we were, by that time, we had decided to get married in the rabbi's house, and the rabbi said, don't worry, we'll find a best man. So he went to the front door, we were at his house, by that time, my mother and my mother's friend and I, we were all ready for the wedding, but we had no best man. So a man was walking by carrying a loaf of bread. So the rabbi says, Mr. Bergman, I, <laughs> I don't remember much, but I remember Mr. Bergman. And just now, first time I've thought of Mr. Bergman in years. And he said, can you come in? Mr. Bergman says, I have to bring my bread back. He says, you'll get your bread back. Just come in. We need you now. So he came in, and he was the bed ma best man. And if I had a camera and I had taken his picture, you would have seen his loaf of bread. Did he, did he share his bread with you? No. He just stayed, and he was introduced as Mr. Bergman, and he says, I've got to go home. My, wa my wife needs the bread. And so he said, goodbye, good luck, goodbye, and off he went. So hold this picture in front of you. Just hold it showing the camera. Hold it in front of the camera, and then tell us about that picture. Oh, this picture was taken the day we got married. And the thing is, first we had to go to the find a store, Cartier's was a very fancy store in Palm Palm Beach. Yes. I think so, or Palm Springs. Palm Beach. Palm Beach. And we picked out and we got the ring. And Is that the ring you're still wearing? It, I have part of it I'm still wearing. I'll tell you about that. And so we picked out the ring and I had come. I had bought my own suit. We went to the florist. We got our flowers. He had his outfit, and we got the photographer. And the thing is, we had a wonderful ring, but about 20 years later, I found that I wanted to make it a little bigger. So as you can see, I think at our 25th wedding anniversary, we took the diamonds 
from the wedding ring, there were little diamonds here, and we put them on this ring. And so now we have my engagement ring and my diamond ring all together. And just so we understand how long this romance lasted, how many years did you stay married? I'm trying to remember how many years it was when he died. We, this, this was our wedding. We, we went to the photographer and had the picture taken that day. And I have other pictures somewhere in the book you'll see that we have. But, uh, it was 67 years. 67 years that he, uh, how long we lasted. And what day did he die? I don't know. It was on your anniversary. Was it? It was March 6th. March 6th. Oh, I remember he was in the hospital and we, we were going to take you to the circus. We were going to take you. The opera. Huh? We were going to go to the opera. Opera. We were going to go to the opera. And we made plans, and um, then he, I'm trying to think. He died that afternoon. That afternoon. You, now, Mom, tell us about his uniform, because sometimes we see him in a dark uniform, and then other days we see him in a light uniform. Do you, do you understand that? Why was he sometimes in a light uniform? So look at this picture with you with the nice hat. Here, this is... That, the one on the left. That's his summer uniform. Oh, that's the difference in his summer uniform. Summer, he couldn't wear a heavy... And that's his... And here's his <laughs> summer, sort of a work one. But that hat, that picture with you on the upper left, what do you... Do you remember about that hat? Well, this looks like... I remember the dress. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. All right. Now, you got married... And did you have a couple days of honeymoon? We were in Avon Park. And where, do you remember, did you stay in a hotel, or where did you stay? Well, and then we also stayed in Palm Beach, West Palm Beach Hotel. In fact, about 10 years ago, we took a trip, and we decided we would go to see our hotel where we were, uh, where we had our dinner. We had a dinner for about five people a wedding dinner, and they said, well, you can't come in. I says, why not? I says, we were married here. We should be able to come in. I was, you know, quite, uh, he says, you can't. This is a nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> you could have moved right into the same room that you stayed in. We could, but they were adamant that I wasn't ready for their nursing home. So you had your romantic night, your first night together. Yes. And how, many, how long did you get to stay together before you had to go home? When, when are you talking about? After you got married. After, well, oh, then he, he was going to study to be a bombardier navigator. He had a special training, so he had to go to Langley Field, I see. Yes. Langley Field, Virginia. Seems to me that we went there, and uh, and then he flew overseas to England. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so then he went off to England, right? Dad got was stationed in England, right? And did he write to you from England? He wrote often. There are many, many letters in this book that he wrote to me. And what do you remember about what his experience was like when he was in England? Well, he was. He wrote a lot about his his the pilot. He was a bombardier navigator. That was a very big honor that he had because he when he shot the. A, a, a bomb down. He was the nobody in the whole crew could drop a bomb until he had dropped the bomb. He was the lead bombardier, and he spent quite a bit of time talking about that until pretty soon 
There were no more letters. Well, hold off on that because I want to get to that in a moment. Were you worried about him when he was in England? No, because he spent so much time in the letters telling me about the uh, something he had bought, bought for me. Candlesticks. What? Was it the candlesticks? Yes. He bought, and I still use them. I still have them. Silver candlesticks. And but you weren't worried about his being in the war? No, I. It's it's called. I don't know how old I was. Twenty. Twenty two. Twenty two. Nothing was going to happen to him. You weren't worried about his being killed in the war. I. It's really strange. I must have been either stupid. Or something. Optimistic? <laughs> hopeful? I don't know, but I was never fearful. In fact, when he was shot down and he was in a prison camp by then, to show you how optimistic I was, March 6th was our anniversary. I took a girlfriend of mine out to lunch to celebrate my anniversary. I never for a minute, not for a minute, thought he would not come back. After all, he was my husband. He was going to come back. So let's talk about how did you first come to learn about his plane being shot down? Well, the thing was, I, I went to work as a dietitian at a Girl Scout camp. And, why, and I just now, just recently, reread that, reread that letter. And they came, I was, I don't know, doing something with the kids. I don't know what I was doing. And then all of a sudden I looked and I saw, and I'm crying now. Who did you see? I saw my mother and my father coming to me at this Girl Scout camp. They, my parents were never the type that would go to visit their children at camp. They weren't. They sent them to camp, go have a good time and whatnot. But when I saw my mother and father coming into the big apartment, into the big gym where I was busy with the kids, I don't know what I was doing, but something I knew there was trouble, and that was it. And what, what did you think was the trouble? Well, I felt that my husband had been killed. Actually, I was happy because he just was taken prisoner. But at first, you fe when you saw them, you thought he was killed. It was the end. Well, in fact, the first telegram you got... They, they came with the telegram, right? I think so. I think they brought the telegram. And the telegram... Because it had my address in South St. Paul. That's, how they, well, that's where the telegram went. So that was on August 8th, and I'll read you the telegram. It says, um, The Secretary of War desires me to express his deep regret that... Fourth, your husband, Second Lieutenant Marcus Hertz, was um, was has been reported missing in action since the 28th of July over Germany. If further details or other information are received, you will be promptly notified. So you didn't know whether he was dead or alive. That's true. Then you got letters from the army saying that he was believed to be dead, right? How long did it take before you learned he was a prisoner of war? I don't, I don't remember that. Hopefully it's in that letter. It should be, a it should be. Almost exactly a month. And it says, report just received through the International Red Cross states that your husband, 2nd Lieutenant Marcus Hertz, is a prisoner of war of the German government. Letter of information follows from Provost Marshal General. Um, so that was a telegram you got. 
And then how did you feel? And then, oh, well, I was really happy. And we had a group in St. Paul that was called Officers' Wives Club. And then I shifted into gear. <laughs> and what did you do? Oh, we started to pack boxes. And, we, and, and in there, there are some thank you letters that, when Mark finally got them, he wrote to thank me for them, different things, and to tell me what to send him in. And I learned more about it. There must have been maybe 20 people from St. Paul who had children or husbands or wives who were in the same very large prison camp that my husband was. And you were able to write letters to each other. Yes. And those letters are so beautiful. I hope whoever you are, <laughs> if you see me, I hope you get to see some of his letters. They are just beautiful. Well, let me ask you about that, because we have the first letter that says, I am alive and well and in good spirits, not a thing for you to worry about. I love you and am anxious to hear from you. Write soon. Address is on the other side. That nice. And so it's kind of amazing that in the middle of a war, he's in a prisoner of war camp, you can send letters back and forth. Well, the Red Cross handled it. Red Cross was the vehicle. And that was considered normal, that you could write letters back and forth? And then he has this letter where he says, please send me the following, milk chocolate big pieces, cigarettes, this quick, a pair of pink pants, size 30, green shirt, size 14, cap, size 7, beans, any kind, but lots of them. And what? Beans. Beans. He wants you to send him beans. So did you send him these things? I, whatever he wanted, I did. And was that normal that you could just send food packages to a prisoner of war? We had to work through the Red Cross. I don't remember exactly. It seemed to me I had to take it to the Red Cross, and they sent it something. Okay. I'm not. And he would write back to you, and you would get letters from him. Lots of letters. Now, we have the letters, and they had special letterhead that you had to write on? Yes. And where did you get that from the Ar Army Club, the Officers Club? I think from my Officers Club. Okay, so then what did you know about what his life was like in the prisoner of war camp? I didn't know until really after the war. And then there was a movie. There was a movie came out. I think it was called Stalag Luft or something. Well, there was The Great Escape. Great Escape, yes. And then I learned a lot about it from that Great Escape. You saw that? Yes, right? yes. So... But he was there, and you were writing to him. Now, we, don't, we have letters from the first camp he was in. He then moved to another camp. Right, and that was, I reread it just the, oh, the other day. The information about that other camp was not clear. It was called 7A. And I'm not sure that that's in the... Is but did you... Well, we don't have any letters written from that second camp. No, the letters from him end in January. Well, then he walked across Germany to get to 7A. Mooseburg. Mooseburg. But there were some letters from there. Okay, so you still got some letters. Yes, the letters from Mooseburg came to me. And that was his second camp. Okay, and then when did you learn, tell us about what you learned about the end of the war and how he was liberated. I don't know. I, I can't remember except the one thing that he wrote about and that I heard about is that he was in the camp and he looked up and he saw a great big uh, vehicle of some kind. And standing up, he thinks that he saw one of the generals. Patton. Patton. He feels he's 
that Patton released him from his camp. Well, there, is a, there are pictures of Patton coming to that camp. Right. Now, that was at the end of April. And then... And then there's a telegram, not until May 31st, and it says, the Secretary of War desires me to express his pleasure that your father, your husband, I'm sorry, my father, your husband, Marcus Hertz, has returned to military control on April 29th. And that's when he saw the patent. And then tell me about your reunion. Where did, where did he, how did he get back to Minnesota? Did he come, he came to New York first, right? And then he came to Fort Snelling. I think maybe I met him in Fort Snelling. I'm not, I can't, I'll have to look at that again. It sounded like he came to New York and then to Fort Snelling. Right. What, how did he look? He was pretty thin. <laughs> <laughs> but he looked healthy? And then we went off to a camp. I have to tell you something cute. It was a, uh, a, a camp called, um, what was it called? I don't remember. What you mean for a little holiday? And what? You mean for a little time together when he came back. Right, and the thing is, the, there were girls who were camping there too, and they all fell in love with him. <laughs> so, you had to fight them back? <laughs> <laughs> I had to fight fight to get ne next to him. Here I'm there, <laughs> and, and those girls are just charming. He, he was so cute and so handsome, and, and he was wearing his uniform. He... It was really... You were happy to see him? Yeah. Very. He was happy to be home? He was happy to be home? Everybody was glad he was home. Thank you. That's wonderful, Mom. Those are wonderful stories. Yes. That, uh, well, the thing that is so thrilling for me... I knew we were happy together, but I never knew he was as romantic as he is from those letters. He After 67 years, you kind of forgot about how romantic he was? How romantic he was. It was just it's wonderful to have that information now. Wow. So I'm going to just take a little break. I'll be loving you. Okay, I'm Deborah Hertz, the middle daughter, the middle child, the female child. So Lorraine, this is a wonderful opportunity. I've learned so much about this beautiful past, and I must say that as a child, there's nothing more gratifying that I can imagine than knowing that your parents loved each other passionately. It's, it's a gift to us to have this romance come alive. Really a gift. So I want to start with a question about memory. And I'm thinking of a phrase, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I'm thinking that dad, as we were growing up, every night would come in to put us to bed. And there was always the same story. We stole a chicken. We were on the run from the Nazis. We made a fire. We ate the chicken. And this is really why I became a historian, because of that chicken. Kind of like you with the cookie and becoming a dietitian. So I'm wondering how the experience of the war and being a, a war wife and the memory of the war, were there certain things that were really awful to live through, but once they were over, and the narrative had ended with marriage and motherhood, that the, mem that the events seemed different than they seemed at the time? I need a few more clues. I'm thinking that Dad was damaged by the war, but he was also glorious in the war. And he was both at the same time. And as his child, 
it was very difficult to understand whether one of those two experiences was the experience from the time. Because his letters, when he's in training, he's so proud. He's had such a great escape from poverty, an escape from the meatpacking jobs, an escape from the difficult circumstances of losing his mother. And he seems really happy. But he can't have been that happy when he was in the prisoner of war camp. And I'm wondering, as the years passed after the war, were there things that became happier in memory than they were at the time? I think that's very possible. I'm trying to... I remember there was a movie that came out. I want to call it 7A, but I'm not sure that that was the movie. But it was a movie that took place at his prison. The Great Escape. The Great Escape. He was very proud of it. And probably what you're saying is true, that during the time he was living it, he wasn't, it wasn't so glorious. But then afterwards, when he realized how brave the, his fellow um, Air Corps people were and how they helped each other and they stole the chicken, I think those things became important for him. No, I, I think, I think on the whole, and as I, I reread most of these letters, I think he was proud to be in service, but at the end of the war, when he was at Mooseburg, and they uncovered and they saw all of the Jewish soldier, Jewish people who were in prison camps that they had put them in because they were German they were Jews because they were German Jews that that was terrible for him to realize that a whole country of Germany could hate people to that extent that they'd want to kill them no i think that it it maybe looks better upon reflection but at the time it was happening, it has to have been terrible. I remember his talking about how they would pack up the Jews in trains and take them to concentration camps. We, we talked about that quite a bit. But if you go back to 1942, and you go back to the Northrop Auditorium and Roosevelt announcing the war on Japan, were you feeling, both of you, more as Americans or more as Jews? No, more as Americans. At least I did. I, and I felt that when, no, I, I think that the Americans should be attacked by Japan. That was the terrible thing. And as the war progressed and you got more news about the Jewish situation, did did your identity change? Uh, we, and then as we met people like Felicia Weingarten that came back from Sir, that were escaped, they, they lived, they, you know, that they lived, then our hatred toward the Germans was immense, especially Hitler. Anything to do with Hitler was just terrible. Do you, did you ever see any Charlie Chaplin movies making fun of Hitler? I remember he was what was called the great dictator. But did you feel that humor was a bad approach or humor was a good approach? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think about that. All I knew was how much I hated the Germans. I didn't think about the approach. I didn't take a scholarly feeling at so all. I want it, I want it. I want you to go on an imaginary trip to Germany during the war and imagine, if you can, a German wife whose husband is fighting the Americans and she loves his uniform. Well, 
I don't know. It, it, you mean that I would feel sympathetic toward her husband despite the fact that he maybe did terrible things to Jews? Well, I didn't say that. No, you didn't say it, but it sounds like we're sort of talking. Well, I'm just wondering this idea that women in the 40s loved uniforms. Do you think um, that was something specifically American, or you think that was on all sides of the war? I don't know. I, I, I can't. I, I have to th well, think about that. Maybe we can talk about it another time. Because I can't, I can't quite, all I can know is hate everybody that killed Jews. That's, that's as far as I can go. You have a line in one of the letters that really came out in neon. You say, and it's where dad is already in Texas, and you're writing to him, and you say, I went to a Kadima meeting, Maybe I'll go to Palestine. Did I say that? You said that. And I always thought it was fascinating that Dad felt such a powerful Jewish identity. If, there's, if anybody asked me anything about my father, way up at the top, I would have put, he loves Judaism, he's a proud Jew. I would have put that ahead of... I think that's true. I think that was true. And that was a gift he gave to all of us, which I hope to pass on to my children. And I'm wondering, um, Dad followed events of the State of Israel very closely. Did you two ever discuss moving there? No. We went there two or three times. I know that I did. I mean, did you think that... Uh, the state of Israel was a solution to the problems of the Holocaust. You know, it's interesting. I never, I never connected that. I should have, but I didn't. I didn't. I didn't connect it. I felt that the only solution to the Holocaust is to get rid of Hitler. So that was just a wonderful day then, when the war was over and Hitler was dead. That was a fabulous day for you. That's actually true. Would you think it was one of the happiest days of your life? No, I don't think it was that. But, but knowing that it wasn't going to go on, that did make me happy. Did you ever have any conversations with your parents? Your father was, a, was an avid reader, Al. Maybe not Ruth so much, but Al was. Did Al ever fear that the Nazis would come to the United States? I don't think any of us did. I, I, now that you bring it up, I ne I'm telling you the truth. I never thought of that. It never came to me. And I was, you know, I was at university, and I should have heard something if there was talk about that. I didn't hear it. So um, you talked about your friend Felicia. And um, her experiences in the Ludge ghetto. Can you talk a little bit about um, prisoner of war camps and concentration camps? As you, if you would have been asked in 19, when you knew he was in the POW camp, if somebody asked you, draw a picture of what you think a concentration camp barracks looks like. Draw a picture of a POW barracks. Would you have a clear separation? Uh, the, the difference is with the concentration camps, people were being killed all the time. But when you're in prison camp, I always assumed that he would get out and be free. But if I had a friend who was in a, another kind of camp, I wouldn't be as optimistic. I think the end, the end game is different. I felt that Jews in Europe, under the control of the German government, 
those Jews would be, it'd be a miracle if they'd survive. And did you ever think back to, um, like, Aaron Hertz, Marky's father, was a second generation. No, he came as an immigrant, Aaron, right? Did I, have I got my... I think right? so. I okay. think the immigrant. In your family, there aren't any immigrants until going way back to Mary's parents. So did you ever think about, oh, I'm so glad that on both sides of my family, they left Europe long before World War II? I know that I did because I remember whenever I would be do, doing something and I had to have the date, my mother's birth date, my grandmother's birth date, I was always happy that their birth dates were later. I mean, I, I didn't ever worry about my relations being in concentration camps. Right, right. So... Yeah, that's it. what's so interesting about your experiences is that when you go through something as an individual, it has a different meaning than if it's just in the newspaper. I think so. That's how I feel. So I want to talk a little bit about your work and your work ambitions during the war. Dad, Dad's letters are amazingly pro you and everything about you. He loves that you're such a good student. Forget the D in chemistry. Just leave that out here. Um, he's so proud of you. And you're, you're getting this degree in diet, dietetics, nutrition. And um, he's very proud of you. But then at a certain point, you have a chance to go for some further studies or an internship or something for the best dietitians in the country. And you have a sentence in your letter to him. You say, I won't do this because that's only for single women. And I have a husband, so I shouldn't do this, or I won't do this, or I'd rather not do this. Did I say that? You did. And I wondered if you could remember those feelings. Well, it was actually, it was more because you children were young. I felt I needed to, I needed and wanted to take care of you. I don't think I could ever pack up and leave you guys. No, no, no. This is a letter during the war. We're just a twinkle in your eye. Okay. Now let's go back to your question again. You're studying dietetics. You've gotten your degree. Right. You're working in the camp, in the Girl Scout camp. Let's not get these camps confused here. And you have a chance to do some further study in your field. And you turn it down. The internship in New York. Yeah, it was Montefiore. It was New York. What was I going to do? It was just... Uh, I, what was so it? You were offered an internship at a hospital in New York. And I think I wanted to go to that. And you told me that you turned it down because you thought if Mark came home during the two years, you would have to quit to come home to be with him. And that's why you didn't take the job. And that's what I told you? Yes, what you told well, me. Well, then that, that must have been true. I don't... Ask. Well, well, did you have the feeling during the war that women had great opportunities because the men were gone? <laughs> Not at that time. I didn't. I do now, but I didn't then. So if you had married, if there had been no war and you had married Mark, even though he didn't have a uniform on, would you still have studied dietetics? Sure. I, I wanted my cookie. <laughs> no, that, that was not, there was nothing wrong with my studying dietetics. They, hospitals with Jewish people <laughs> needed dietitians. No, that didn't ever come up. You know, one of my favorite lines in the letter, letters is when Mark is sort of slightly mocking you um, and saying, oh, you did such and such because you love to help people. And I thought this is the be most beautiful thing about your character, that he refers to this call to help. And I think you felt that call to help so many times in your life maybe so many times every day. Um, so that was a beautiful thing about the letters. Okay, I have one last question. 
Um, and that has to do with the fact that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was not always helping the Jews. Oh, I know that. When did you learn that? Oh. I don't know. Probably in with some books that I read. I really do. I can't read. people talk at the time about any weaknesses? There was, there was some talk. There was some talk. He, he had Jewish friends. It was interesting. I think uh, Secretary of Treasury or something. Yes, I, uh, Morgenthau. Yes, yes, yes. yes. That's what it was. But uh, all in all, could you just tell everyone who's listening today what was the great thing about FDR? Um, I think, in many ways, I think he was quite dramatic. When I'm talking about those Sunday night fireside chats, those were very important. If, if I would say nobody could make a phone call at 7 o'clock on a Sunday night because President Roosevelt is going to talk. What I'm trying to say is that he had a strong, positive personality. And I think that's important, and it's very nice to have a president whom you have that much respect for. I don't know if that actually answers your question, but that's... That's my answer. Okay, so now in this family room, we'll have a round of applause for Lorraine. I don't have to go to New Orleans now. You're going to be on prime time, Lorraine. <laughs>
there'd be a picture of somebody we knew in the paper who was a casualty, many casualties. And did your father or mother or yourself, did you follow, were you able to follow what was going on in the war, where the American armies were going and where they were fighting the hardest? I think we followed it quite well. I'm sorry that I don't remember it very well, though. And did your father have any maps or globes in the house? We did have we did have a globe, and we did follow it. Actually, we probably followed as well as most people. Then, I want you to go back as best you can to... I believe it would be May of 1945. And at that time, I believe Mark had been liberated. But suddenly, or not so suddenly, the end of the war in Europe was announced. Can you remember that day? Where you were? What you heard? I'm afraid I don't. I... Those of us who had loved ones were so involved following that loved one that I think I can say we probably didn't follow other people as well. No, I, I understand. Um, were there any, and probably there weren't by this time, were there any political figures who were questioning the war? Was it unanimous? Was everyone in favor of the war? As far as I remember at this time, I don't remember anyone finding fault with our going to war. We were attacked. We needed to fight back. And that's what the situation was, as I remember it. I also want you to go back to, I believe it was March of 1945, when, tell me where you were when you heard of the death of Franklin Roosevelt. I think that I probably got it from some later book but I remember the fact that he had had a lady friend, and the lady friend was with him wherever he was at the time that he died, and how those of us, millions, of, thousands of us, who admired Eleanor Roosevelt, felt so sorry for her that Rose Franklin had a girlfriend during much of the war. Yes, her name was Lucy Mercer. And, um, and Eleanor, uh, Eleanor was in Washington and Franklin was in Georgia at the, time of, at the time of his death. Did you, can you remember anything about Harry Truman? Harry Truman, we have a very nice thoughts about him. He and his wife were both kind of folksy people, and they lived in, I think, they lived not far from Kansas City. That's right. They lived in Independence, Missouri. Independence, Missouri. And he had a Jewish male friend, and uh, he, uh, and he was a loyal person, and he and, you know, he seemed very unassuming, but he turned out to be a very good president. The, when you were worried about Mark, especially when he was shot down, and even in the prison camps, can you remember getting support from girlfriends, parents, cousins, other relatives that were supportive of you? 
Um, I don't remember there. I do remember there was some distant relative that I can remember was kind of snide and said, oh, look at her. She thinks he's going to be okay. He'll never come back. But somebody in the family said it. But isn't that nice? I forgot who it was. Uh, tell me some of the... Your, your sister had a husband. Did he ever go overseas? Though? Yes. He, he was in the... I think he was in the infantry, and at one time, he I think he even went to Korea. I can't remember exactly, but it seemed to me he was in some branch, and he went over into, I don't know if he was in the Korean War. I don't remember that. You did have a lot of correspondence with your sister. Not very much, because mostly... I mean, she wasn't there with him all the time. She, w she was living at our house and working then. There would be no reason. She was, we were all in the same house. <laughs> Do you remember when your brother went off to war? My brother went into the, was he in the? Was he a merchant marine or Coast Guard? Some, I think may, the... maybe Coast Guard. Now, he was young. He was about 18 years old. He was Did you remember when he left? Mm -hmm. No. And how about, you had some, um, were you communicating with Mark's family? Irvi, his brother? And he, we, in fact, we once took a trip to Washington, Mark and I did. I don't know if it was right after we were married. I don't know. Couldn't have been right away. But we went to Washington, D.C., and we went to visit Anna Grace there, and she had... That's Mark's sister. Mark's sister and had one or two little boys. A lot of people lived in Washington, D.C. Um, what do you remember... About the radio, did you get? Did you remember listening to the radio? Oh, the most important thing about the radio is Sunday night, and that's that was. I think I mentioned it before. The fireside chats that Roosevelt had. I think almost every Sunday night, it was like seven o'clock. He talked for about a half an hour, and we just all felt he was like our our dearest friend who was coming to talk to us about what was going on in the war. It was a very thoughtful, fine program, and it was every single Sunday, as I remember. This you may not remember. Can you remember any f movies about the war that you liked? Well, the one that strikes me is there was one called Mrs. Miniver, and Mrs. Miniver, I think... Maybe her husband was in service. I don't, I'm not quite sure, but uh, she was a loyal wife of a soldier, as I recall. But Mrs. Miniver was her name. Did you ever see any of the Humphrey Bogart movies? Yes. And his beautiful girlfriend, lady friend, or he married whose name I don't remember. Lawrence Bacall. Yeah, Lauren Bacall. Lauren Bacall. was beautiful. Lauren Bacall. Anyways. No, she was wonderful. Um, well, that's those are the questions I have just about the environment of the war and your time, and it's, it's wonderful to hear you talk about it. Bob Hertz, son of Lorraine, brother of Fred, brother of Deborah.
loving you. 